So I'm Dorothy Higginshaw Patton, and um, I was seeing that, we're, that the book festival was coming up this fall, and I had two new books coming out, and I thought, you know, it'd be fun to be part of the festival this year. Um, what might I do with some other people? Because I really like collaboration and cooperation with other people. I work a lot with uh, artists or photographers and scientists and the process of creating books. And uh, I always enjoyed that process. So I thought it'd be fun to think about what might be a topic of interest to people who would come to the festival. And I thought, well, you know, I've been writing books now for many years. And uh, I have a lot of books at all different age levels. I've written for everything from uh, the kind of a book that you might, you know, have your baby on your lap and you're turning the pages, you know, for them. And uh, everything from that kind of book to a couple of adult gardening books uh, I did with a, a friend who uh, <coughs> was a, her husband was in the botany department. She was a trained botanist. And we wrote a gardening books about what the plants are up to and how we can take that into consideration, you know, garden secrets. It was a pretty, pretty, did pretty well. And um, <clears throat> I did a cookbook with my husband, Greg, about apples because my dad grew up on an apple ranch in Idaho. So uh, I have a special attachment to apples and he, he does, uh, he's cooking and writing about food. So we did that together. So anyway, um, I coordinated a lot with other, with other people and I thought I've done all these different age level books and different kinds of topics. And people sometimes say, like a scientist like Doug here will say, what is it that, you know, how do you do this? How do you take scientific information and make it understandable to young readers? And I, I say, well, how can you stand all the detail work you have to do to make sure you don't make any mistakes in a scientific manuscript and get in trouble for that? So, um, so anyway, I thought it'd be fun to see. And then Beverly does a lot of book reviewing, so she's from the viewpoint in terms of the kind of work I do of evaluating my books. So I thought it'd be fun to see what different, you know, different approaches and then of course what people in the audience are, are, are interested in. And uh, so my, this year, my two recent books, and I'm going to be here again tomorrow in the same space, hopefully some of you will, may come to learn more about some of the stories about doing these two books, because they're both different age levels. This is like, uh, five to 10, and this is 10 and up. So they're very different topics, very different animals, very different books for very different publishers, actually. Mm -hmm. It's a teeny, teeny publisher. This is a gigantic publisher. So anyway, so I thought it would be fun to, to talk about these, uh, these different factors and uh, get different people's viewpoints. So uh, Doug Emlin over here, I got to know him because he's, he's a professor of biology at the university. And he has written a textbook with another author. And he has a book for adults on animal weaponry. And he was going to be writing a book for kids on that topic. And other people said, well, you should talk to Dorothy because she's a trained scientist and she writes <laughs> books for kids. So maybe she could give you some advice. So that's how I got to meet Doug. And uh, he's a great guy. And he's, got his, he's been spending time working hard on writing a book for kids about animal weapons. And uh, then Beverly is the chair of the English department, and she spent many, many years reading books like mine and uh, fiction books, any kind of books, a lot of books for kids, and evaluating them um, for young readers and libraries and so forth. So uh, we thought it would be fun to, to uh, present together and get these different viewpoints and so forth. So Doug, uh, tell us then a little bit more about you. All right, I'll be quick at the beginning and just say again, as she alluded, I'm, my day job is not as an author. I'm a biology professor, so I have a research lab and I work with graduate students and we spend most of our time writing, but either writing as a professor, working with students on term papers or working with graduate students on manuscripts or writing technical papers for journals or grant proposals. We write a lot of grant proposals. <laughs> well, a lot of grant proposals. But, um, but about 10 years ago, I sort of broke out of that and spent more and more of my time trying to figure out how to articulate the things that I thought were important, the big concepts in biology, for audiences that weren't other scientists. And, and my backstory there, if you're not paying attention to the news and what's happening in this country, science is in trouble. I mean, we're at a point now where fewer and fewer people in our society understand what science is as a process, why it is a valuable way of knowing, 
it, it has become very political and it's lost its sort of objectivity as a, as a, as a data-based rational way of learning about the world. And so I feel like as academics, we failed to get our message out. Whatever we've been trying to do really didn't do what we needed to do. And, and I became more and more sort of impassioned by the idea that I've reached a point in my career where I can spend some time trying to learn how to do this better. And so, so for me, that started with teaming up with a brilliant science writer, Carl Zimmer, who, if you haven't heard of him, he writes for the New York Times and for Discover and, and has a number of books. But I got the chance to work with Carl on a textbook for college students. And we really tried to make this the un-textbook. We didn't want it to be another textbook. We built the whole thing around narratives. So it's very story driven. It, it, took a lot of iterations and a lot of tries to figure out how to find a balance between telling stories on the one hand and including the content and the concepts on the other. And we broke a lot of rules that are sort of standard for textbooks to do it. But now in its third edition, it's really starting to work. And there's 200 and something universities now that are using it. So I feel like finally wow. we've broken in and found a niche yeah. and found a way to try to make this stuff exciting and relevant for college students. So then I took it a step further. I had a chance to write a trade book. I didn't even know what a trade book was when I started that process. I was like, what's a trade book? Um, my attempt at trying to use the research that I do on animal weapons and tell stories around that, and I ended up sort of stumbling on the surprise that all the things we were learning about animal weapons, which is what I work on, apply to military technologies too. So I spent several years pouring through the literature on military technologies and arms races in our sort of technical, technological past and spinning those stories together. So this is my first attempt to do that, came out a couple of years ago. And then the real reason I started interacting with Dorothy and ultimately met Beverly and got to know her was taking it one more step and now trying to tell the backstory behind this. All the adventures of a life spent poking around in the rainforest studying beetles and how does a biologist who studies dung beetles on the one hand end up talking to an audience of military top brass about cybersecurity on the other, or flying out to an aircraft carrier to talk to the captain of an aircraft carrier on duty in the Pacific about parallels between animal and military weapons. And so it's sort of a backstory adventure designed to try to pull kids into the reality of being a scientist and the sort of stories along the way of how you do the process. It's too soon to say whether that worked, and it's a little thicker than this. This is just a little flyer. Actually, it proofs out there if anybody wants. It, um, it's like 160 pages, but it's an attempt to, to reach sort of the 10 to 14 year old audience. And I guess the genre is narrative nonfiction. Um, and we'll see if it works. But it, it's my newest adventure. Anyway, that's me. And I'm just absolutely delighted to be here with Dorothy and with Doug because my, my field is English teaching. And I work with both beginning and experienced teachers of English, along with other subject areas as well. So I've been teaching for over 40 years and absolutely love it. I've been a middle school teacher, high school teacher, two-year college teacher, university methods teacher. Um, I just, I love connecting readers of all ages with authors and their writing in whatever genre is going to resonate with, um, with the readers. So what I look very carefully at is how to make those connections so that we enjoy and celebrate the reading in the classroom and beyond the classroom and kind of say, oh my gosh, what kind of a reader and what age might that reader be? And look at all the ages of readers who read different kinds of books because we know that when we read a book for the first time, we're at one space, age, perspective. You read a book again and life has happened to us. And so we will read that book and we will get new insights or new takeaways and new ahas. So I think sometimes one of the wonderful things that I have a chance to do is to have people go and reread something and say, rediscover that text and see what it means to you now. Perhaps if the first time you didn't like it so much, maybe the next time you do, or vice versa. You know, life happens. But um, I love connecting readers and the writers through the genres and text, and, and especially in the classroom, because that's my field is teacher education. So I've been at the University of Montana since 1981, where I direct the English teaching program and the Montana Writing Project. For five years, I was the chair of the English department. Now I'm, I'm back to my single job, <laughs> which <laughs> consumes me, of course. Uh -huh. And um, one of the things I really love to do also is when I travel internationally and work with educators around the world and students around the world, is I get to take 
these different types of texts and genres and authors and introduce um, people around the world to the diversity of literature that exists within our schools and within our society. Because um, if you think about another country, you might say, what literature do I know from that country? And is it classic or is it contemporary? Is it young adult? Is it a children's story? Is it something that's um, an adult? A piece of writing. So again, I love to make those connections. So I get to be here today to talk about how I look at literature and think about how classroom teachers, librarians, and or parents might help the reader make connections. Let me just see who we have in the audience. Um, educators, librarians, raise your hand. Yeah, okay. Parents, okay. Community <laughs> members who are in different fields or disciplines. People who love to read? Okay, everybody. <laughs> People who love to write. Okay, I'm just just, just really curious. Um, who else do I need to ask about? Who didn't raise his or her hand? <laughs> Everybody's included in this. And we want it to be a conversation. We really do. So this is not this is not a formal lecture. This is a conversation where you have a chance to ask us questions and we have a chance to ask you questions. And, Discuss. So. Yeah, well, let me just uh, throw out a few things uh, here. When I was thinking about um, about this, this and all the different kinds of aspects there are to choosing what to write about and how to present it to an audience. And uh, there are just so many different choices. Um, for example, I guess the thing that got me started thinking about it was the fact that this book is for um, uh, five to ten year olds and it's about a popular American animal everybody's heard of beavers you know and it's for little kids and lots of lots of wonderful photos from a, an amazing candy oh, I hate that word amazing amazing and perfect <laughs> two words I don't they're, they're overused amazingly overused perfectly anyway uh, <laughs> so this book um, has a lot of beautiful photos taken by Michael Rutz and uh, and uh, lots of animals and plants and pictures of beavers and not that much text because it's for, for younger children. And so even a five-year-old could go through here, you know, and ooh, look at the snake, you know, and really enjoy the different, different images of the book. And uh, so that's, and then this book is full of science. My a very highly intelligent uh, nephew sat down with this book to read, read the whole thing from cover to cover. He's a He's what, you, what people call a rocket scientist. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand. Uh, and I was hoping it, that Mark would be able to understand <laughs> my, my book. He read the whole thing and he said, he stood up and he looked a little dazed reading it all at once because it's like 84 pages and uh, full of various, lots of information, including um, a lot of science. There's immunology, there's genetics, there's uh, kids learn all kinds of different things. It's lots of it's not meant to be read in one sitting. Anyway, he stood up and looked a little puzzled and dumbfounded, and he said, there's a lot of information in there. <laughs> I learned a lot. And I thought, yay. You know? So anyway, it also has a lot of photos, because nowadays the children are visual, so much more visual than, they, than books used to be, a lot less illustrations. My first book was with black and white drawings. Mm -hmm. So we go from that to this kind of, of uh, book. So that was one thing, is like the uh, different age levels. And then, what if you want to have reached more than one age level with your book? And so my, the editor of this book had the idea to, uh, about the wolves returning to the Yellowstone, this book has, uh, has had a lot of life because so many things are happening in Yellowstone that are good because the wolves have come back. It just keeps increasing. So she said, I want you to have for every spread, it's two pages, it's called a spread, I want you to have like one sentence that tells part of the story and then expand upon that with a paragraph. So that's what I did with this book. And the, the photos in here are from a wonderful photographer who lives uh, in Silvergate, just outside the park. And so he's able to spend a lot of time in the park and get wonderful photos. And so that's the way the book is constructed. There's one or maybe sometimes two sentences and then an expanded paragraph and then the photos tell a lot of the story. My editor was determined not to have any captions on the photos. So I said, 
okay, good luck. <laughs> but then, of course, that fell back onto me. <laughs> so I had to make sure the words made it such that they didn't need to have captions. And these stories with the single sentences had to tell the story, the complete story, without the details. So it was an interesting challenge for me, and uh, I did enjoy it a lot because I'm, I'm a wolf person. Uh, my license, uh, I have a bumper sticker that says, please forgive me, I was raised by wolves. Uh, <laughs> given to me by my next door neighbor who knew me well enough to know that was perfect. Anyway, so, so this uh, is, I did that book this way, and then uh, it's interesting because I found out the teachers were using that as a help in teaching about, uh, about paragraph structure. These were like topic sentences for a paragraph. And I hadn't written a thinking that, but uh, two or three different teachers told me they figured that out on their own. And teachers are very smart people. Well, and, and that's what I wanted to just, you know, to, to have sure. a conversation with you is that when we find wonderfully written books, whatever age, the teachers say, oh my, this can be um, a model so that I can use it for instructional purposes to help the, the students be better readers and then in turn help them be better writers. So what you just said, many classroom teachers would say, wow, Topic sentences, supporting detail. And I really love that. And also one of the things that I do with teachers and librarians is put together text sets, T-E-X-T-S, text sets. So if you have a book on beavers and you've got a group of students interested in beavers, you can bring together different books about beavers in different genres of science writing or stories that, that have beavers at the center with a lot of science background and have students read in that basket of books, if you will, about beavers. And they say, what do we know? What do we want to know? What have we learned? And different books, because of the way they're written, or the photographs, or the drawings, the students then, you know, they, they have an inquiry project, or they're doing beetles, or they're doing wolves. And so you can have a class that are, that the class of students who are investigating, either everybody's looking at beavers from their diverse perspectives and questions, all the way to this group of students is doing beavers, this group of students is doing wolves. This group of students might be doing insects. They're doing dolphins. Do you see? So there are lots of instructional ways that we use our science uh, and science writing books, both both in reading and learning content as well as writing. Yeah, and teaching from you know using nonfiction books as part of the learning process of how to read and how to write. Um, you get kind of a, if you're a teacher, you get kind of a twofer because you can, they're also learning information that they need to know. Exactly. And so if you're reading, I mean, fiction is great. Um, you know, stories draw in the readers and get them excited about things. But uh, in terms of, uh, of learning, if they're doing nonfiction, some nonfiction reading, they're also learning about the subject matter at the same time. Let me just put in a little note right now about my organization that I belong to. Uh, I have some cards in the back there, the front, whatever that area is, uh, <laughs> about uh, Ink Think Tank. And we're a bunch of nonfiction non writers for kids. And our goal is to get kids back to being engaged with the world around them and with the history and what people do and, and what's, what you know, surrounds them in cities and, and in nature uh, because they're getting so dis they're so um, unconnected with their, with their own lives now. They're too busy with their devices and things. But anyway, and textbooks tend to be so generalized, they're not, that, they're not engaging uh, uh, readers. And if a kid reads, his, reads textbooks and is bored, he thinks reading and learning are boring. That's the last thing we want them to do. So we write uh, about different topics and different writers with different voices. Mm -hmm. And we may have two different people who write about, say, uh, uh, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. And uh, so there are different books about these topics. And you can, if some students read one book and some read others, then they can do, a, they can compare and contrast you know, what they've learned and how the writers write about those, those uh, topics. So I have some cards back there. We have something called the Nonfiction Minute, which is a website where we have every day, every school day, we have a different, no more than 400 word piece of writing uh, about some cool nonfiction fact. Like I have one called the, the flaw in the seedless banana. You ever think about the fact that bananas have no seeds? How do we get banana trees without any seeds? So uh, that sort of thing. They're the kind of thing that grab people's uh, curiosity. And it's a free uh, blog the nonfictionminute.com, and we also have teacher guides there, T2T 
section for each minute that gives suggestions for how to use it in the classroom. So, and we have a, we also just started publishing some, republishing some of our out of print books and so forth. So anyway, it's a great organization and any, and, and you don't have to be a teacher to, to read them in the minutes. Anybody who's curious about the world can take a peek. So I just wanted to kind of put that little plug in there because it's, I, I really, that's my goal is to, is to help kids become engaged with life and be excited about it. And that's a teacher's goal. Yes. And I think that's a parent's goal. I mean, we're all in this together. Right. Doug, did you want to say something about what you were saying? No, I mean, I, I was curious about the book where you had the sound bite, the, the thesis mm -hmm. statement, and then the paragraph. And I like the idea that that could be instructional, but it also just got me thinking that we live in a world, and especially the kids that we're trying to reach, live in a world you know, of like little Twitter feeds and sound bites. I mean, mm. it, it's, it's unfortunate in a way, but they process information, it seems, the shorter and cleaner the better for, for them getting it and thinking about it and it's sticking. So, I find that discouraging on the one hand, but on the other hand, learning how to work with that so that you can reach kids that, that are used to that kind of sound bite mm -hmm. and get them hooked and then pull them in and let them take it one step further than by reading the rest of the paragraph by love. Yeah. The, the other issue that I keep thinking about, and I, I talked to Dorothy a bunch about this because she helped me a ton with the, the chapter book that I've been working on, is the approach that you're going to use. I mean, some of these nonfiction books, it reads, it's not like an encyclopedia at all, it's way better written, but it reads like a nonfiction, like you go to Wikipedia or some source and you want to know what something is and there's a there's sort of a factual account of what it is on the one hand, and then there's this style of trying to tell stories, so it's almost like you're trying to write a fiction book, but it has the science woven into it on the other, and it's a totally different way, and that's, it's the one that I'm trying to learn. I hope I've managed to pull off to some degree with the book that I'm doing. But that was the struggle that I always had. It was the most fun to write and the most fun I'm assuming to read when I'm talking about adventures and snakes or spiders or crazy things that happened in the field. And, and you're telling a story about an adventure, but somehow as an academic, I want there to be science in there. I want there to be concepts that matter. And so, again, one of the lessons that she taught me is show, don't tell. You try to weave the, the, the biology that's relevant into it, so it just kind of is part of the surroundings and the story. But you still can't do it all like that. So I would reach these points where I had to stop the narrative and actually sit down and actually explain the science. And, we struggled with doing it as a box, so it's pulled out, so there's the story and then there's a sidebar, or trying to work it in so that I'd have a couple narrative chapters and then a short chapter that actually deals with the science. And we talked about this when you had me sort of show excerpts to, to your right. class of teachers. That's a, that's a dichotomy that I probably will continue to struggle with for years, but, <laughs> but there is sort of a fundamental difference in how you're presenting the material. And ideally, I wish that we could do it all with the story Although maybe we shouldn't, because there's a lot of people that actually like reading things in a concise, articulate, precise way. Anyway, well, and, that's where and, I'm at, sort of in, in terms of how we do this. The, the examples that you're giving are very much the no. concise, articulate, precise way of presenting the science. And I've been struggling with the other way. Yeah, there's another, let me just say again, yes. this other book, it's another book where I, that has uh, different age levels. This is a book that I did uh, with, uh, for Mountain Press with help from the, uh, uh, American Prairie Reserve, which is trying to is establishing this beautiful prairie preserve in mid-central Montana. Uh, the idea is to have have it be a park for people that where the animals live the way they were, lived on the prairie in the old days. But anyway, so the problem was getting wanting to attract kids to the idea of you know I would love to go to the prairie and see it with um, the facts about about the prairie for families and for older kids. So what I did with this one was to create a fiction story about a calf who grows up, uh, who was born on the prairie. It's, a, it's like a, it's it's fiction in the sense that there is no no calf with this name who did exactly these things. But it's the kind of what a calf would under the kinds of experience a calf would have in the first year of its life. So that's a story in in bigger darker text for uh, like parents to read to a little kid or for a seven year old to read, and then sidebars and other pages with uh, more in de facto details for uh, the parents or for older kids so they, they learn things. Like this, this one happens to be uh, like a box. Some of them are by a box, some of them are full page, different ways of doing that. So that's another way of approaching that is having a, the fiction as, as a story, but then the facts uh, not just woven in, but also uh, some of the facts are uh, as a separate part that different people would read. 
And see, what I love about it is that there is no one way. There are different ways, different ways to do mixed modal genres and points of view. So I think the challenge that all writers probably have is to figure out for this particular audience and this particular story and information, which one's going to work best. But I don't know that there is a best only way of doing it because you look at the variety of science nonfiction books with narratives or not, and they're, they're all over. But that's what I love about that field. But uh, that doesn't make your life easier. It just means you have to make a decision and then go with it. <laughs> um, we, um, we brought in his manuscript, or, or not just the manuscript, but the draft. The chapters, yeah. Right, of um, Beetle Battles to my... Um, that's the young adult one that comes out in the summer. Exactly, the one that he has the... Um, the proofs for. The proofs for. And I asked him to bring it, I was teaching a, a, an advanced reading class this summer. And so these are both beginning teachers and experienced teachers. And I asked him to select a chapter, and the chapters are short, they're only... Yeah, it looks huge, but that's because it's fat paper one-sided. Right. It's not going to be that huge. Right. I asked him to bring in a chapter that was more narrative. Yep. Where there are humans interacting. Embracing that dichotomy. There, there, were, there are scientists engaged in their science inquiry and journey. And to bring in a chapter is a little bit more science factual information. And we, we did a discussion, and, and Doug was just wonderful to come into the class and to respond to the teachers' questions and their observations. Do you want to re re remember some of that and share it with well, us? Well, part of it, my challenge then, it's how do you pluck a couple chapters out of a narrative that, that has a a beginning, you know, and an arc and an end, pull something out of context, hand it to a class, and hope that they'll be able to get something out of it. For the narrative part, it was pretty easy, because the story's a story, and you can pick up wherever you are, but the content stuff, I had to pull a chapter from the middle of the book that built on ideas that hopefully had gradually been laid down in the earlier chapters, so, so I didn't know what to expect, but my sense is they got a lot more out of it than I wanted, and actually my biggest surprise was vocabulary. Some of the words that they flagged were not the kinds of words, I don't, I've got, I wish I could remember the examples, but, but the words that they picked that they thought would be difficult for their students were absolutely, utterly not the words that I was thinking at all would be a problem. Mm -hmm. I guess I was thinking more for, for sort of scientific term, terminology, right. and they were right. thinking, I can't, gargantuan, or right? things right. that I really wouldn't have thought of right. as being tripped up words. Exactly. So it was really refreshing for me to see that, wait a minute, Mm -hmm. They're looking at this through a very different filter or a very different mm -hmm. perspective right. than I was. It and for a when you would think you can get that definition through context, mm -hmm. right? But not all students are good with picking up context clues. So one of the things I do with my teachers is to say, can the student infer what gargantuan means in the context of the story of the paragraph or the photograph? Mm -hmm. And if not, then are there other clues in the sentence or the paragraph that the so I want to jump in on that. When I'm trying to articulate an idea or a term from science, mm -hmm. I try very hard to figure out how to phrase my my sentence so that the context is there. That's correct. But when I'm thinking about a word like gargantuan, and I'm not trying to do that, <laughs> I just take it for granted that they know what that means. And so, so, so it's interesting. They might not get it right. from the context right. of words like that, exactly. but I really hope they would get it from the context when I'm talking about you know terms that are sort of academic. Because exactly. I tried really hard to I make know. them self-explanatory. And that's one of the so. joys I have is that sometimes people will, uh, will be kind and share with me their drafts, and I'll have a chance to read it from both the intended audience's perspective and age as much as I can. And then I try to read it from a librarian, parent, and teacher's point of view and say, are there any places where a little bit more or a little bit less might be helpful? So I, I enjoy that. So I want to come back quick to something that Dorothy said a minute. She was talking about her book and she said that you can tell the story from the calf's perspective. So there's the narrative. And then she said, and then I have these boxes here for people that want to learn something. <laughs> So coming full circle, I mean, I guess you can bring us to you guys and to, and to them. How much, how much do you think, I mean, I guess I want to believe that it should be possible for kids to learn something from the stories too, and not just from the sidebars. I guess I feel like if we do it right, the, the content that matters is part of the story enough that it's just there. They get it because they're perceiving it the same way that the person in the, or the animal in the story is perceiving it. So how much do you think you can really get content across through the story as opposed to using the story to carry the interest, then stepping aside doing the content, and then before they get bored and switch, pulling them back in and getting them back interested?
Well, of course, the story. I'm putting you on the spot. Where you guys <laughs> yeah, don't know how to do it. But anyway. <laughs> that's okay. That's what life. That's what makes life interesting. <laughs> um, when, of course, if you run the the, inter the story with the calf and the mother tells a lot about the life of uh, on the prairie. You know what they're eating, and you know the calf being born, and how the how the the bulls uh, don't like to have the calves around. You know, I mean, one of the bulls gets you know the calf away from the from the mother because he wants to mate with the mother at that time of year, and uh, so you learn about how the calf you know experiences lives its li experiences its world. Um, so you learn you learn you know how about the fur their shedding and all these these things that uh, are part of the life of the animal are, are woven into the story. And the other uh, information, for example, like Native Americans on the prairie. I mean, there you know there's. Um, the word, the story itself is in the present, and so you, it, you know, that that you can't really talk about that. So that is in the sidebar. So it is, it is, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a dance mm -hmm. yeah. with a lot of hard steps in it. And, and Jeanette Engel's the big bird. Oh yeah, has, that's wonderful. Has the narrative from three or four perspectives, yeah. different chapters, different characters' perspectives. <laughs> but then she has the field notes about the actual fire, the temperatures, the weather, the climate. So she actually has the field notes right there. And I think um, Snead Collard's uh, Cloud Forest of, of Costa Rica. Oh, I love that book. That was right. one of the first books that actually talks about scientists and what they do and what they find out and how they go about it. I, right. That was before. And now there's a lot of books like right. that. I mean, this whole series of scientists in the field. Right. Uh, and there was a big concern. I wrote an article for Hornbook about is our science books for children dead because they were just there was we were trying to find ways to communicate with with kids, and that was like one of the first books that succeeded in doing that. He talked about a lot of different scientists in one right. book, and then now we have a series that's devoted to showing scientists as human beings and how they carry their work. And, and the information that results from their work. So, and, and I think that's you know thinking about developmental progresses of, of readers. There are many readers, not just young readers, but but human beings who say, if there's a human being or an animal with with human <laughs> traits I can identify with, that it brings the the reader into the story in a different way than reading just a, a science more science based text. But that's not to to disrespect people who just love the science-based information. They're just written in different ways, and they can be written quite engagingly. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's different readers at different points in their life might resonate to different kinds of genres. And so much of it also has to do with how we as teachers or librarians introduce these texts and authors and topics <coughs> to our students. Because you can take any great book and actually kill it. Right? You take Hunger Games, and if you do it incorrectly in a classroom, no longer is it interesting to read Hunger Games, right? Or you take the movie Hunger Games, and all of a sudden you have a multiple choice test, fill in the blank test, essay prompt. All of a sudden, there's no longer we have to go and watch the movie Hunger Games. And that's not to say we shouldn't do critical creative thinking when we're watching a movie or reading a text, whether it's science or, or fantasy or, or whatever. But we as educators have a, a, a huge responsibility and commitment to make a text and the, the topic come alive for our students so they enjoy the engagement with reading and they're learning it and then they want to read more and learn more. That's lifelong learning and reading and writing. So, yeah, we, you know, we don't want to do anything except positive things with our, with our text and our So I want to throw a quick twist up there that came from what you just said over here. I remember at a conference for evolutionary biologists in Canada a couple of years ago, David Quammen was a keynote speaker, and he was trying to talk to scientists that were trying to do what I was trying to do and learn how to write to broader audiences. And I remember him getting up there and saying, people want to read about people. It's like, you're all biologists, you might want to write about slime molds or fungi or plants, but people want to read about people. So if it's going to work, you have to make your slime molds about people. Right? And, and, and I guess I'm curious, because I would, I would there's a side of me that feels like kids don't hold to that rule. That you can you could get a child excited about a bison calf, or you know, interested in the in the narrative perspective of animals in a way that might be harder with an adult. I, I don't just mm -hmm. defer to the experts. I'm curious how that resonates with with the two of you or with the audience. But this idea that was sort of ingrained in my head that if you want to hook them somehow or other, it's got to be about the people. Yeah, I wrote one fiction book 
And I told you I was a wolf person. And uh, the only fiction I wrote was there was way back in the 80s, the first wolves came down from, yellow, from Canada on their own into Glacier at the time that people were, were discussing bringing them back you know, by trapping and releasing in the uh, lower 48 states. But these wolves were just doing their own thing and they were starting to come down and they've been one, they recognized there was one female wolf because uh, they, they see her tracks and she had a, lost a toe probably in a trap or something, but they could recognize her tracks. You know, it was always the same wolf they were seeing the tracks of. Nobody ever saw the wolf herself. I don't know if anybody ever actually saw her. She sort of disappeared in time, but a few years later, a bear researcher walked into a meadow just, you know, looking for things, and there was a, it was a rendezvous site for a wolf pack. Nobody even knew the wolves were reproducing in, in Montana at that point. I can't imagine how the joy and amaze and surprise she had at finding these pups out in the meadow, you know. But anyway, so I wrote a book kind of in honor of that lone wolf. And so my book was about a female wolf that comes down, I mean, in my mind coming from Canada, but it's, there's no uh, anthropomorphism, mm -hmm. no making the animal, a, you know, like a human. So it's all from the wolf's perspective. So she comes down and she finds a maid and, and uh, they, have, they have pups and they, pups learn how to hunt. And then the question is at the, you know, at the end I have them learning about the, you know, they've learned how to hunt and now next year they'll, they'll be better at it next year because they don't have such great luck at first. But anyway, so we had this big discussion about, about the book and the story and uh, Bruce, Bruce Whitey and Pat Tucker had a, they did wolf programs for, for schools and things for, for years and they had Kwani the wolf and anyway, it's a whole other story. But anyway, they're good friends of mine and uh, they were, they kept saying, every time I see Pat, she whispered in my ear, kill the wolf, kill the wolf, or kill the pup, kill the pup, kill the pup, kill the pup. Well, I had set up one of the pups, I thought, to be less, uh, you know, less about that particular pup than the others in case I, wanted, I would do that. But I was really having, you know, a problem. Somebody said, you know, all the, all the animal stories that sell, well, you know, the animal, an animal dies. <laughs> so if you want this book to sell, you got to have one of these animals die. Oh, so I couldn't decide what to do. And then eventually I, I, I rewrote the end of the book and I wrote this, you know, the, the deer kicks this one pup in the head and, and the pup doesn't wake up, you know, the original version, he's, you know, waking up and he's going to be okay. <laughs> this version, he doesn't wake up, and you know the sun rises. And anyway, so uh, so Jeanette was so angry with me. She was in our critique group. She said, "I will not ever watch, read that book to my grandchildren. How could you kill the pup?" <laughs> and even when I read it to the group with the new ending, and then Peggy Christian, who was in the group, Peggy, yes. she said, "Not that one." You know? <laughs> How could you kill him? He was the one you knew. Yeah. So they really got, you know, identified with these. But this book has not sold well. It sort of disappeared, and I was frustrated by it because I thought, you know, this is a, you know, and I got, my editor loved it, and the reviewers loved it, everybody loved it, but nobody was buying it. And my husband here, at one point, years after when I was, com was complaining in frustration about it, I put it back, it's on the internet now as an e-book that I had put together, and he said, There's, there aren't people in it. You know, I mean, you look at the uh, Julie of the Wolves. Yes. There's yes. a you know, there's a girl in there. Yes. There actually is one person, but you don't really meet him because he's a he's a trapper. And he almost you know he she gets caught in a trap that he has set. So, John, you had well, one. just thinking about the discussion of people um, and looking back to my childhood and interest in science. One of my first books that sort of introduced me to science and the natural world was actually an autobiography or memoir by Gerald Durrell oh, called yes. Our Family and Other Animals. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's largely about his family and about his relationship with this guy on the island of Corfu who is a naturalist mm -hmm. who sort of adopts him and he brings home any stray critter that crosses his path. Uh, and actually, they, they have since made it into a, a PBS uh, TV yeah. show. Yeah. Uh, so the the book is much better. But, but that was my introduction to an interest in, in 
you know, the whole concept of, of science and studying nature. Right. I appreciate what you're saying because I think children, either through the parents or the librarians or the teachers in the classroom, they learn about science in multiple venues. Think about, think about the interest in dinosaurs, right? Think about students or children's interest in volcanoes or hurricanes. I mean, often those are quote unquote pure science. It's not a human being out there engaged in it. But I mean, there are all kinds of books about dinosaurs and volcanoes and hurricanes, um, dolphins that don't have a human being in it. They're just books about science. So I, I think that we, we introduce children to the concepts of science in multiple ways, whether it's through stories, where there is in fact a human being, along with just, hey, turning the pages and learning about the, the sperm whales or um, orcas or, or whatever. So yeah, and then sometimes it is the human being out there picking the flowers and looking at the flowers and trying to understand the bees and pollination and, and so forth. Yeah, those Gerald Durrell books, were, they were translated into all kinds of languages, and including Hungarian. And we have a dear friend, Robert Powell, who, who teaches at the uh, uh, college in uh, Butte now, and he is a restoration ecologist. And he's an amazing guy. He's come here and worked at the university here on, on weeds and stuff. And, and he's you know, working with Butte to try to, Butte is nowhere near fixed, by the way, from uh, <laughs> after the mining. And neither is the Clark Fork River. And Robert knows all about this. But anyway, he's, uh, they're also, they're putting in fake beaver, beaver dams uh, uh, and doing experiments with that. I got to see that when we visited them last weekend. But Robert fell in love with the Gerald Durrell stories. And they've even gone to Corfu, he and his wife, and they've gone to uh, England where they have a, a, a help save endangered species of small things that people don't even know are endangered, like lizards and stuff. You know, we all yeah, don't think about the elephants close. and the cheetahs, you know, but <coughs> the little things are endangered too. And that's a focus of, uh, of, the, of his uh, wife and Gerald Durrell's wife and family. But and the take I'm getting is those worked and they resonated for so long because they were anchored with the story of the people. Yeah. The family, right? It was the, the interactions with the family and the naturalist that carried it and then all the cool biology got brought in. Well, yes. and Gerald was sort of the, the, the second son because he was sort of overshadowed by his older brother Lawrence, who yes. was this acclaimed novelist uh -huh. uh, who took all the, you know, got all the attention, really. Gerald was just messing around with animals. <laughs> <laughs> I think John uh, points out as one of my favorite books of all time too, and I think it's important to have humor when yeah. you're talking yeah, about a lot of humor animals and well. educational yeah. books, yeah. because a lot of times you don't want it to read like a textbook, and a lot of books do. And I think that if you can incorporate humor in, that's really important. And Gerald Durrell's book definitely had humor. <laughs> Thank you. Good observation. Yeah. Was there another? Yes, please, hi. You know the, the title of the book about wolves that you wrote? Oh, the, 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 it's uh, called, I called it Return of, the, Return of the Wolf because I was thinking in my own, I probably should have a different title, but I was thinking, you know, why I wrote the book was because this, you know, they came back on their own from the, through Canada. But uh, then there's also uh, this one, the Yellowstone book is When the Wolves Return, which is a similar title, but, yeah. uh, yeah, the Re Return of the Wolf is on, you know, have it as an e-book, but it's, it's not available as a print Can book Can you get anymore. it with either ending? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the half ending version. Yeah, you could republish it and have you know, a different version. Like and the Lydia and the Tigers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Open ending. Pick your, pick your own adventure. Exactly. Well, one of the things I find interesting is that um, when I teach young adult literature, sometimes I'll pause it uh, of historical fiction that's that's wedded in, in really good research with the actual historical text. Um, and so, uh, for example, the Driver Shirtwaist Factory Fire that was in, in New York City. And so I will have um, a, a young adult version of the women's protest movement and the factory conditions and the immigration and the labor movement during that time period. And I'll posit it next to the historical fiction book, which is deeply accurate with um, with the research of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, and I will <laughs> randomly assign half of my class to read the the, the 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 historical text first, 
And then the other half of the class reads the historical fiction text first, and then they flip, right? To just see, is there a difference between reading the history first and then the mm -hmm. historical fiction, or read historical fiction oh. and then the history? Yes. But what's interesting, too, is, is that, <laughs> well, but then sometimes I would say, how many of you love historical fiction? They'll raise your hands and you all get to read the history book for it. You see, so I try to change things up because we all have our, our passions and our genres, and sometimes we get we learn our history through historical fiction, but if we don't know enough history, we don't know whether the the actual history that's woven into the historical fiction book is as accurate as it might be, right? What that tweak to make the narrative as opposed to the straight history text, which is reporting about that, and then how do you make that come alive in case it wasn't as engaging for some reason. So I, I try to look at my, my beginning teachers to say, are you aware that different students in your classes resonate to different texts? But let's make sure that we sometimes pair them so that we get both and and not the either or. D does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Don't kind of watch me. And that's true also with your science book. You can do that also with your science books. Other questions or observation please hi this may be a little off topic as this is a, a talk about engaging youth in reading and I have a question about engaging youth in writing uh, Dorothy I loved your use of the um, of, of the, um, the the short statement in this uh, oh, book about the, the um, and I thought and I equated it I, I thought it's uh, somewhat of an equivalent to a thesis statement in a five-part essay so I'm thinking, what other aspects of the way youth consume information on their devices, is there any way that I can incorporate that use into the rest of an essay? Oh, you mean you're, I'm not quite sure you okay, you're talking. I'm just thinking of a thesis statement as a short quote, a sound bite. Uh -huh. And then they've got the three supporting statements mm -hmm. and the conclusion. And I'm wondering, what? I'm thinking of the way kids consume information on their devices and how it's just short, bam, 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 bam. And is there anything that I can use about how they consume information to encourage them to use that the same skills, if you want to call that skill, into their writing? Well, um, that's into into their their own writing. Because I'm thinking, yes. like you know, non-fiction non yes. minutes, you know, the t these T2T uh, uh, suggestions, you know, written by a librarian and, and teacher, you know, she talks about a lot about websites you can go to to find out more about something, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know. Uh, that's not what you're talking about, though, is it? I'm just thinking of how they consume information today, and if there's any segue I can make from. How they consume information into writing skills. Can I add a thought? Yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time working with college undergraduates on writing essays. And so I've learned the hard way that a lot of times they'll just launch in and write. And sometimes it's really hard to you know, decide how to give constructive feedback. Do I want to step back and talk to them about the structure, the overall mm -hmm. framework of the essay, and where they're trying to go? or you get into the weeds with the details of the writing and the grammar and right. the transitions. And so what I've started doing now is I have them give me the structure first. So it's like the sound bite. They definitely have to show me their thesis statement. But then instead of writing the paragraphs, they give me a bullet. This paragraph will say this, this paragraph. So it's almost like a thesis statement for each paragraph mm. and how they're going to tie it together and what their conclusion is going to be. And they have to turn that into me first. Mm. Maybe that's not the same as how they use information, no, no, but it's taking great. that approach. Yeah. Forcing them to structure the yeah. essay and think bullet style. This I'm going to say this and this and this and yeah. this without actually saying it. You know, it's like it's not the, the actual final writing. They're showing me what they're going to do, and then I give them feedback on the overall layout and the balance and the and the transitions and help them rearrange things. And then they actually write. So yeah, and I think that that question is really interesting because if students are reading text sets on beavers or wolves and they're reading multiple um, texts on that one topic and we say what are the most important things you learned and how would you tell it to an audience who doesn't know about them and so you can say okay out of all the things I've read about wolves and these three or four books about wolves um, 
then you can say, okay, what, what are the two or three most important things that you'd like to tell people who have never even understood what a wolf looks like? They don't know the difference between a wolf and a German shepherd, for example. Or they live in a desert, they don't know what the ocean looks like with orcas or something like that. I mean, then you can really start synthesizing information. And that's where it becomes important where students aren't just um, memorizing and giving back the same information that they've read in one text. It's called plagiarism sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but synthesizing and summarizing and deciding what the major ideas are for an audience, those are critical thinking skills and those are the standards for literacy. Because you have to put yourself in the mindset of your audience. That's correct. And that's a very sophisticated perspective. And that's why I love to read different manuscripts is I try to put myself in the role of that young audience, be it the child, the teenager, um, you know, whatever. So whenever I'm reading manuscripts, I'm saying, okay, who is the intended audience? What's the purpose? What's the genre? And can I imagine myself in that perspective? And then what would be the reading like? How would I be feeling? What would I understand? What would I not understand? And then I read it again from a teacher, librarian, educator point of view. So you've asked a really great question. Thank you. Yeah. I have a feeling, I don't know about the three, we're running out of time because I've seen people arriving for the next event. I don't know, how does that, are we over, going over time? Or? Are there any yes. last five observations minutes. or comments or five questions minutes. for us? Five minutes over? No. Oh, five minutes to go. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, any other comments or questions you might have? I didn't mean to, to stop. We have five whole minutes. <laughs> yes. Were you going to read? Your, Me? Yeah. Were you going to read what you had in your lap? I was not intending to read. Oh. <laughs> I brought this. I can show anybody okay. that wants to look at it. I was more talking about it. We didn't know where this would go, but I mean, oh, the okay. idea of having a writer, a scientist, and a teacher of teachers, however you want to, we thought was an interesting blend okay. that, that could you know, that would be fun for talking about the challenges and the yeah. strategies. Ah, thank you for the interest, but I didn't pick the section. Next year. Yeah. Next year. Yeah, and I'm going to be here in the same space tomorrow at 11 <laughs> talking about these two books. That's just me. Because uh, they're so different, you know, and they're both new books, so I want people to know about them. There's, and apparently Sundays they close the street. So if anybody, any of you want to come tomorrow at 11, uh, Figure out where you're going to put your car. <laughs> I hope it isn't raining. Yes. No? It's too big of a question. It's too big. <laughs> oh, no. Big no, question. No, we no, could no, always talk outside, outside, you know? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, I will say, on the question, if any of you are interested in this, I'm happy to send a link to a PDF. I mean, it's too late for me to change anything at this point because it's not with the printers, but I would love critical feedback. So I'm happy to share a link. And, and again, just I'm so glad, glad that I could be here with you, Dorothy, and with you, Doug. My, my role in, in a, as a writer is I write textbooks. Uh, but the textbooks are engaging, I hope, and they're used in elementary, middle schools, and high school. And uh, I'm going to China on Monday because they found one of my books that I wrote for John Wiley. I wrote uh, John Wiley, Keys to Success, and one of the books was How to Write a Great Research Paper. Unbeknownst to me, somebody in China found it, and Peking University Press bought the translation rights from John Wiley. So Peking University Press has translated into Chinese the book How to Write a Great Research Paper. So I get to go to China on Monday and work with Chinese educators on how to help students be better writers of research papers. So I can be a writer too. I am a writer too. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being with us. We appreciate you.